Okay, welcome to the GPLH webinar, Unlocking New York State Funding, Understanding the Consolidated Funding Application. I am thrilled to introduce our first speaker of the day. Steve Densmore is the president and founder of Choice Words. Steve has spent the last 25 years working as a communications professional, an award-winning writer and journalist. Steve's career path has evolved to work with communications as a consultant for several uh, non local nonprofit organizations. He's got a very impressive list here. Um, he launched Choice Words in 2010 in response to an increasing call for supportive communication services among uh, many Hudson Valley nonprofits and has been supporting them ever since. Um, additionally, I love this, Steve currently sits on the Hudson Valley Economic Development Corporation Board of Directors. So thank you, Steve, here with that uh, interesting uh, perspective for us. Uh, Steve is joined today by his vice president, uh, Brianna Maloney. Brianna has been grant writing for 12 years and has won nearly $30 million for her clients. Um, and we are so thrilled to have her here today as well. Um, Steve and Brianna will cover tips and tricks for completing the CFA and more specifically how to demonstrate your economic impact, which uh, if you've done the application before, you know it's a huge factor. So um, Steve and Brianna, please take it away. I'm already shutting myself down. So um, thank you very much, Michelle. Appreciate the introduction and uh, uh, thank Maureen and uh, Deborah for hosting us today and giving us this opportunity to speak to you all uh, about the CFA and some of its uh, trials and tribulations. I think though, first we wanted to just do a quick poll of you all because we're not really sure who knows what out there about the CFA business? So we're going to just ask for a quick response to the poll, and um, and that'll give us some insight. Maureen, do you mind hitting the poll? I've made you the host. We basically want to know how many of you have actually done a CFA before uh, or been a participant in doing one. Is that out there? Or? I'm sorry, um, Deborah. It's not. It's not showing up as an option for me. Okay. Deborah, you know, maybe we can just raise. Maybe we can just ask folks to raise their hands. Yep, I think that's the way to go. You know who who out there has uh, has done a CFA before, but also there's a raise hand function that you can do on your screen. Good. Good. So maybe we want to see the whole the whole chorus out there. I counted five so far, Steve. Well, I'm not I'm only seeing along the right hand margin. So because we've got our our presentation up, I think. You have to use the arrow, the down arrow to scroll down. Okay. Technology, not my strong suit. So I can look on the participant list and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six people who have raised their hand with the uh, the emoji. Okay, so, and out of how many are in our audience? 31. So there's a lot of inexperience out there. Hence your, your being here today, got it, okay. I think we can move on from there. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're gonna appropriately, I think, go into the basics. The, oftentimes folks say, I did a CFA, and that really is a misnomer. So the CFA is only a portal to apply for state funding to as many as 20 some or more different grant programs run by several different state agencies. It could be to Parks, Environmental Facilities Corporation, Empire State Development, whatever it is, once you get into the portal and register, you're given the opportunity to select the program or programs you want to apply to uh, through the CFA portal. 
Um, what you'll find when you get in there are threshold questions that essentially, if you if you say yes when you should say no, it'll bump you out. It'll be, you know, they're pretty obvious, but you have to fill them out. Then you proceed to the actual application and the the application is is kind of long unwieldy the the, the it the question numbers are not in order there, there's a lot of oddness to the you know it's not an intuitive program so i'll warn you of that straight up um but the, one of the most important things we try to stress and do, and by the way, my company and I have done over a hundred of these. So we kind of have uh, just a uh, knee jerk understanding of what's wanted and what needs to be done. The point is we, we had to go through a lot of scrape knees to get to this point. So we've learned a lot the hard way over the years. Um, once you get into the the actual application you'll find that the upper portion of it the upper third or so are questions that are common to every cfa regardless of what program you're applying to those questions are more general They're, they include project description statement of need how it aligns with regional goals how it aligns with uh, the, the region's priorities, um, uh, you know, project timeline, regulatory review, all those things. But the, the important takeaway on this section is that it defines the first 20 points of your application and that the program specific aspect of the application, the, the remaining 80 points are scored after the application has been reviewed by the Mid-Hudson Regional Council staff. And they review it from the point of view of the, uh, we can advance this now if you'd like, please Bree. Um, the Regional Council's staff job is to see how it aligns with regional priorities, which in our region is, is summarized by live, work and play. You can find that broken out in the resource guides that the Mid-Hudson Regional Council's website offers. You can find there, essentially it's a five-year plan that has been updated and, and um, annotated over, over the remaining several years. Um, but when you get into that, you see how the question project description, statement of need, regional priorities all relate back to these, uh, this this workbook and the, what the regional goals are, and I can't stress enough how important it is to try to relate your project, whatever it is, back to those priorities, and and to demonstrate economic impact. Even if even if you know you're a nonprofit, you're a charitable organization doing, you know feeding the hungry or teaching uh, children to dance, it still is worth your while to try to relate that to the economy and to jobs and to economic impact. And sometimes that could be tough, but it but it matters in terms of being um, competitive in the long run. Because that first 20 points, if you get, if if they give you 20 points, you're considered a priority project for the region. And that usually, not always, uh, leads to being funded. What it's saying is that the Mid-Hudson region thinks this is important to the entire region, that it be funded, and it's got the imprimatur of our regional representatives. Um, not many actually get the 20 points, but the drop-off to 15 or 10 can be critical when you're scoring against other applications on the technical side. So I strongly recommend that you work hard to try to, you know, derive your economic impact, um, state how many jobs you you have or will retain or will create through your project. And what we found is that sometimes if you've got a project that, um, that maybe is more substantial, is more um, 
uh, visionary. Uh, it's it's actually worth it to hire a firm like Camoin Associates or there's there's a few others that do um, economic impact studies or analyses that that take your project and project its economic impact, its jobs creation, its its visitation, tourism, whatever it is. It gives you a third party. Um, um substantiation of 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 what you're saying your project will bring about now there are also you know options that can be done through the u.s census bureau new york state department of labor mid hudson community profiles is a very good website that can give you the kind of statistics that the uh the funder is looking for and oftentimes the difference between an, an anecdotal narrative where you 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 say if we do this they will come, and one that's more statistically derived uh, can can win the day in getting funding. So tips and tricks. Let's see if you're applying. So what we've found through the years is that even though through the CFA you can you can select several different programs you want to apply for in one application, essentially. We advise generally not doing that. There are a few cases where it's 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 appropriate, but oftentimes the different funding programs that you're, you're applying for through one application, they kind of muddy the water and detract from the, maybe the better narrative. Uh, I call it a calico cat. You end up not knowing who you're trying to appeal to, especially in that upper portion where the, the first 20 points lay. Um, we also wanted to point out that uh, that state funds that are awarded uh, through the CFA or through whatever agency, you can't rely on other state funds to match that if you've reached the, the threshold. The threshold for, say, Empire State Development Grant funding is 20%. They will fund up to that. If they awarded you 10% and you had 10% as a source from another state fund, you could do that. But you can't have 20% of your project cost covered by Empire State Development and another 20% covered by parks, for instance. Bringing up parks, we, um, we've done many of them. I was heavily involved in the walkway over the Hudson Capital Campaign. And so we we worked closely with parks and then post opening of the walkway over the Hudson State Historic Park, um, we applied and won several million dollars in parks funding. We've we've since done parks applications for many communities. What we found is that in 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 particular in parks, and um Susan will probably get to this in more detail later, but in, in the parks applications per se. They give you an option of certain attachments. But what I found out later on is that if you decided not to provide that attachment, you wouldn't get the points that go along with the, the attachment. So essentially, optional is not optional. It's required. And uh, it's a pretty involved application, actually. Um, I'm going to pitch this over to, uh, to Brianna, who has a lot of experience with the uh, Grants Gateway, Grants.gov registration for these awful bureaucratic requirements that unfortunately, uh, uh, you know, are uh, part and parcel with with applying and actually winning funding from the state. Yeah, that's just a reminder to make sure that, you know, this is what Grants Gateway became. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it already, SFS. You won't be applying through that portal, so it's easy to forget that you have to make sure that you're still pre-qualified. So it's just a reminder to make sure that you do that. If you were pre-qualified in Grants Gateway, you should be all set up in SFS. It transferred, and uh, if you need to update it, just make sure you do that. Okay, good. Um, now, we also have seen in the... You're not seeing the, somebody's saying, I'm not seeing the slides still on the tips and tricks page. I think that's the slide, isn't it? 
Uh, yeah, we just went to more tips and tricks. We didn't go to um, SFS or anything. No, okay. Um, okay, good. So yeah, the project, it's, it's very important, especially in a capital uh, request through CF, uh, through the CFA or ESD or Market New York or whichever one that you clearly define the phases if there are phases to your project. And so oftentimes a project will take several years to complete, but there may be phases that are discrete and definable. Those have to be clearly stated in the project description and in the, and made clear in the budget. And it is it is very important to to make sure your narrative matches your budget that they that they jive together. Um, let's see. Yeah, I wanted to point out that um, oftentimes, especially for nonprofits, uh, for capital awards, that the state awards funding based on a reimbursement basis. So when you get an award, you don't get a check. You actually have to build whatever it is you said you were going to build or buy the equipment and install it and then demonstrate that you've met your obligations under the grant award before you get funded. So there's a kind of a cash flow issue there that um, that you need to be aware of in in winning funding from the state. Um, MWBE is minority and women owned businesses. All state funds require an MWBE uh, uh, participation in the award itself. So let's say you have a $10 million project and you get a $1 million award, 30% of that $1 million award should be spent utilizing the services of, of, of certified minority and or women-owned contractors. They have to be certified by the state to be eligible. So this can this can throw people sometimes, especially when you're dealing with a smaller project. You've got to really work to demonstrate to the state that you tried to identify a certified woman or minority-owned business to complete part of the project. If you don't, and you can't uh, get a waiver, there is a waiver procedure, but it's 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 painful. Um, then you could have that amount of your award clawed back. So it's going to be mindful of that as soon as you hopefully win an award. We just wanted to point out one thing that this is mainly for municipal applicants, but the state and the governor and the state have recently uh, made it a requirement that any municipalities that are going for any of these uh, any of these state funds uh, that they have first passed the pro housing community resolution, and uh, that is a change. That last year was preferred; it was an optional thing. Now it's required. And then I just wanted to briefly go over Market New York as a as an example. Market New York is an Empire State Development sub grant program. Through Market New York, you can apply for either branding and marketing funding or capital investment, and they're very very different things. Of course, the branding and marketing we were able to get one hundred and eighty thousand dollars for Walkway over the Hudson's the greater walkway experience uh, marketing campaign. Um, the idea being that walkway over the Hudson was the applicant and the recipient of the funding, but the program it designed and managed was really designed and managed to, to market and, and appeal to folks who visited the walkway, but had hitherto just gotten in their cars with the train and drove away. And the idea was to try to get them to participate in the communities on either side of the walkway. The key to that and even the capital investment uh, program is to have a really good marketing and or branding 
or some kind of plan that identifies how you're going to spend the money and how it's going to meet the goals of the program. And um, the, yeah, the funding is 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 not just for the recipient. It's for a greater participation in a greater community or region or even the state. So it's it's key if you want to try to win that grant. And it's a very competitive program that you that you back it up with a a good marketing study. I think now I'm going to uh, pass it uh, back to Michelle to introduce our next speaker. Thank you all. Michelle, you're muted. Thank you, Brianna. Okay, thank you, Steve and Brianna. That was uh, great. I was taking a bunch of notes for my own use, so thank you. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce our next speaker, Susan Matheson. Susan is the president of SAM Fundraising Solutions. She has a long history of supporting New York State arts organizations. Um, she's had an extensive mu museum career that started at the Morgan Library while she was still in high school and has just evolved from there. She's worked at the Smithsonian Institution, the National Gallery of Art, and other places. Um, in 2007, she did found SAM Fundraising Solutions, a consultancy specializing in fundraising for art, conservation, and historic preservation. Um, it seems every June and July, Susan is busy writing several New York State Parks historic preservation grants, and she has a history of successful applications for her clients. So today, she's going to review some specific grants that are accessible through the CFA and we'll also cover how to best answer some of those tricky CFA questions. So Susan, you can take it away. Hello, thanks everybody. Um, thank you, Steve, Brianna and GPLH for inviting me to do this. Okay, so let's gonna jump right in. And obviously the first one I'm going to talk about is the um, State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation Environmental Protection Fund grants. Um, these are for, as I say, the acquisition, planning, development, and improving of parks and historic properties. The cap is at 675 right now, which is actually up. It used to be 500,000. Um, as Steve mentioned about, um, you know, the reimbursement grants, these are not matching grants. It, they often are called that, but they're not. Um, so you do need to have some cash on hand, and it actually strengthens your application to show that you have some cash on hand. But unlike some of the others where you have to complete the project, there are reporting requirements through the EPF grants that you can also request funding. So you can submit your documentation, your receipts and what have you and get some of that. So there's sort of a nice cash flow happening um, and it kind of helps you move the project along. These grants fund 50% of the total project costs unless you are in a high poverty area. And then it covers 75%. And you can determine this um, by consulting the park's zip code tabulation area. And I'll go back, explain where you find this and everything in a minute. Um, and I highly recommend you consult this prior to figuring out your budget and your match because sometimes you, know, you think you're in a really wealthy neighborhood. Like I have a client in the Greenwich Village who, you know, surrounded by million dollar homes and, and apartments and they qualified. They were actually above the 10% ratio to be in a poverty. So now they were able to go in for 75%. Next slide, please. These go into three different categories. Um, the parks, which are about um, improving parks, um, you know, new playgrounds, that kind of things, and also includes new construction. The Historic Preservation Program, um, for the rest restoration of a project that's on the National Register, if your property is not, you are not eligible. That said, if you're on the agenda for the, um, the when the parks, the state parks, meet to determine new National Register properties, if you're on the, uh, for the June or September agendas, then you can apply. Um, the sites does not have to be in a park, um, contrary to what is also thought, um, but this grant does not cover new additions and often doesn't include mechanicals unless the mechanicals are part of restoring the historic fabric. 
So keep that in mind. And then the last is the Heritage Area Program, which are within the parks um, heritage areas throughout the state. Uh, next slide. Um, pretty easily, what's funded? Um, these grants are great because they do fund some of the soft costs. So the developing of construction documents, design fees, planning, and the grants also fund archeology. span Keep in mind, that if you can't document prior ground disturbance, you will have to do an archeological survey as part of your grant. So all of that is funded. Um, construction, fairly obvious, acquisition equally as well. And administration, they will fund some of the costs associated with supervision, the grant administration, because there is a lot of paperwork post award, um, the audit and the required sign. The Parks Department requires you purchase a sign announcing the award. They're bright green. You've probably seen them before and they cost $61. So, but that has to be an item in your budget. Another thing too is make sure you have discussed your project with the SHPO office. That's the State Historic Preservation Office. Everyone knows it as SHPO. Um, because you will need their approval and input. You'll also probably need a letter of support. I suggest you get one from them for your project. And I'll talk about letters of support in a minute. Okay, so the question, I'm gonna slow down a little bit now, I talk best. Um, next slide is sort of how do you win one of these? And again, let me look at some of the obvious ways make sure your project aligns with the parks commissioner's priorities. And these are what they are for 2024. So figure out how it fits into that. And it may not be obvious. And I'll talk about sort of unobvious things in a minute. But, you know, to that end, second is you want to make sure your project aligns with your regional Red Seas, Regional Economic Development Council's strategic plan. Um, these individual plans, strategic plans, or strategic plan reports, because there always updates, um, are on each of the individual regional um, websites. It is a boring read, but read through each section and see where your project aligns. For example, I work mainly in historic sites, and often these fit, um, fit into the strategies for improving access to culture or improving tourism. And yeah, most of my projects do fulfill those goals, but there are also goals around improving education, quality of life issues, attracting tech and other issue, um, other industries, and job creation. And a stronger case application will make a case for how the project fits into those as well. Next slide. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now. Where do you go to get the info you need to back all of this information up? And as Steve noticed, um, you know, the parks page, the parks pages have a great wealth of information. Uh, most people go to the CFA or the Red Sea pages, go to parks if you're going in for these grants. Um, uh, let's first start. Oh, oops, sorry. Um, first, let's start with the parks plants. This is, these are found on the resources page and you will need to cite a lot of these uh, when you're at, at, cause there are questions that ask how your project aligns with them. You don't have to fit all, but you do have to fit in some. And the most um, crucial ones are the SCORP. Um, and my running line is I have no idea what SCORP means, but it is the statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan you need to act this. If you're doing a historic preservation project, you need to cite how your project fits into or helps fulfill the goals of the state's historic preservation plan. There are other things, statewide trail plans. If you're doing something like the, with the historic Hudson Walkway, that is considered part of a trail or an offshoot of the trail. So you need to fit into that. Um, also look at your local preservation, historic preservation plans. Most towns have them. There are other things called uh, Preserve America, sorry for the typo, Path Through History. You're doing historic preservation. How do you fit into those? And community master plans. So that resource page will kind of guide you and show you what's available. And then you can kind of move forward from there. And I'll get to this in a minute too. Um, 
so yeah next slide please along with the resources page the parks consolidated funding app page they have an, their own separate page also has a wealth of information such as the forms you need to submit um, including cost share summaries and their samples access to the the poverty level um, the, the zcta um, map environmental review forms because you need to do those sample authorizing resolutions some applications require those. There's a work detail that outlines existing conditions and the work needed to repair and restore them. That document's there. An application checklist so you can keep track of where you are on things. Um, and sample endorsement letters. And I'll get to this in one sec. Um, there's other like links to planimetric maps that you have to submit, photography um, tips, selection criteria. Um, there's also information about easements and covenants. I'm not going to go into that here, but I really recommend you look at that and just make sure either your client or your organization is aware of some of the state requirements with regard to easements and covenants. Now, sample endorsement letters. Um, get everybody you can. What you really want to show is not only that there is the government support, so your state Congress, state assembly, state senator, all of that, your local mayor, all your your local, your town elected officials, state elected officials, federal too. I have submitted letters from Schumer. Um, but they also, what they're really looking for here is community support. So if you have schools using you, get um, um, letters from teachers, the school board, um, organizations that use you, uh, you use your services, um, I sometimes I'll throw in quotes from school children who have been to visit all of that. So you really, they really are looking for that um, community support. And I know this, this will be in the documents later, but those are the two um, websites um, to the pages that I, I just mentioned. Next slide. Okay. Now, what I want to do is kind of take a step back. I know we've given you a lot of information about where to find information and all of that, but it's really about how you present. And like Steve, Brianna, I've done a lot of these too and a lot of successful ones. So, you know, how do you answer the questions? How do you use the data? Because you do have to present a lot of data with these. And I'm going to use a former client to illustrate how I did this. This is the Connecticut State Park and Preserve. Um, and it is a site that is on the National Register, and it is known for, um, it was a colonial site. It, it had a colonial tavern that's buried under that house on the right. Um, but it was also, throughout its history, became what was known as the Southside Sportsman's Club. And that is where the Gilded Age notables, the boys all went to go fishing. And that's the clubhouse where they all hung out. So you had, you, you look at the ledgers, there were Roosevelt's, there were Belmont's, there were Vanderbilt's, there were cuttings. It's part of what is lesser known as this, the Gold Coast of the South Shore of Long Island. Most of the houses from there are gone, but this is one of the, the sort of remnants of that. They had went for CFA several times and we got them all for two projects. One is a historic grist mill, which you see on the left there under construction. It's a colonial mill the Friends of Connecticut were restoring. And the second was a historic hatchery on the site. It is the was one of the first fish hatcheries, trout hatcheries in the country, and it introduced brown trout to this country. And a couple of years ago, it was closed due to an outbreak of infectious pancreatic necrosis virus, which is harmful to trout, but not to humans. So it was really about how did we how did we deal? How do we present the, the the hatchery and the mill as a way of winning these grants over? So I'm gonna next slide, please. I'm gonna start with the statement of need question. Um to read here, it's not all of it, but it's the thing. This is not about local need. This is looking at the need within the larger region and why the state should fund it. It's giving them a justification for your grant. So what I described in the, our app were the losses as a result of the hatchery closure. Um, the preserve, the park um, suffered an economic downturn with over 200,000 in lost profits each year, which we could then document through dis 
decreased visitation, but also a drop in local business pro um, profits. If you can't fish, no one's buying tackle. No one's going to the restaurants. No one's going to the hotels. Um, we then showed how the loss of the hatchery fees, because there's parking fees and all of that, um, could be rectified by the Mill Museum. And we, when we did these applications, we went in for both projects. Um, and we were able to show that the Mill Museum could help build in the shortfall because it provided, it and its educational provide, uh, related programs provided a new attraction that would bring visitors back, but also attract new historic tourist audiences as opposed to just fishermen. Um, then I was able to cite the Trust for Public Lands 2010 report, and this is an application going back a few years, um, on the economic benefits and fiscal impact of parks and open space in Nassau and Suffolk counties. Yeah, there's reports like this out there, which stated that 28% of non-resident non visitors come to visit heritage sites and they spend about 615 million in the area and generate about 27.3 million in sales tax revenues. Thus, we were able to say that a new, you know, we, we know that people were coming to Long Island for heritage sites. And if they we didn't have new heritage sites, people would go elsewhere um, and that the mill would help ensure that that revenue stayed on Long Island. And then we brought in other information about jobs, growth and, and job loss and all of that. Next question. Now, yeah, now we get to the question about local need. This is not the same question as above. And that's a big thing I hear a lot from people about this application. It's not asking the same questions over and over. It's very nuanced. So what I do in responding to this is I build on what was said and then introduce different information and data that bolsters the argument and also fits it back into the commissioners and the state's priorities. So like I was able to say that based on anecdotal information, almost 80% of the visitors go to see the hatchery and they have stopped. Um, we have lost the huge angler constituency um, because they're going to other sites to fish. There are no fish at Connectquat. And we don't, you know, we don't want to lose them. We don't want them to disappear for good. We were also able to document that these angler groups supported the project because they were all giving donations to it. So like the Idle Hour Fly Fishers gave $8,000 towards the project. What was also really key is Connectquad is one of the few handicapped accessible fishing sites in the state. So we were able to say without the hatchery, there's no fish. People who, who, have, who need these sorts of services and facilities have no way to go. Um, we were also talking about our volunteer corp and we were losing our volunteers because there was nothing for them to do. And remember, full volunteer corps are not only um, vital for, you know, senior um, engagement, senior um, activities and that kind of thing, but they're also a full-time equivalence associated with that. So they, volunteers are equally important as in terms of staff. The closure also curtailed the use of the preservation um, of the park by educational outlets. So the school field trips, the BOCES programs, the university courses, the family programs that the park's environmental education department were presenting were, were, could, were no more. So you were, your community youth were losing the opportunity of having this sort of um, experience with the Long Island habitat. And we were losing you know, over a thousand annually. Then we got into environmental, because remember, it goes back to what the, the priorities were, at least then as well as now, is that the lack of fish had dis disrupted the normal cycle of the Connecticut River and was impact impacting the larger wildlife because the birds didn't have any fish to feed on. So all that also became an impact. Um, and then lastly, um, at that time, um, Cuomo had an initiative to expand fishing clinics, which we couldn't participate in because our hatchery was closed. So all of these things really helped document and show that local need as opposed to, you know, and but tie it into the state need. So you kind of, you kind of use both questions to get the full answer in, because remember you've got small character counts. So there's only so much you can do. Next slide. 
Um, now this question is different um, from asking for information um, about how the project fits into the state's historic preservation plan, the SCORP and everything. This question is looking about how it, the project supports local plants. And you are asked to submit the pages um, that's, that show this um, with the relevant sections highlighted. So in the past, I have used, like for Connectquat, I have used the town of Islip, um, you know, town of Islip comprehensive plan updates. I have used watershed um, assessment and management reports. Um, you know, looking at how the report allowed us to, to project to prevent spreading the IPN, thus protecting local waters, South Shore Estuary Reserve Comprehensive Management Plan, which was all about raising awareness and estuary related education, path through history, we were a historic site, and the Friends had a long track record of developing educational um, initiatives and programming for people experienced in the park. We had done local um, a cell phone tour, we had done signage and all of that. Next slide, please. So, so yeah, so you really need to find that additional information sort of outside the usual um, to really back things up. And I look, as I said, downtown revitalization, chamber of commerce plans and reports. Remember local retail has a, gives a real significant indication of how the local town is doing, tourism, economic reports, the economic impact of, next slide. And I'm getting told to finish up, so I want to, I'm just gonna move a little quickly again. I also try to move away from tourism and the usual suspects, because that's what everybody's using in the case for need and all of that. And I, you wanna be unique among the applications. So really look at different reports and do a bit of digging deeper to, um, you know, what's what, might, what will make you unique. And here are some examples. I look at a creative economy. I look at a museum experiences and the value of those, um, you know, tourism and all of that. Um, and the re way to find these is just Google them, to be quite honest with you. I did a project at Rye Playland. I Googled the economic impact of Rye Playland. And believe it or not, there was actually a report and I was able to cite it all. So, um, so yeah, so there's a lot of information you can use out there that will make you stand out from everybody else. Next slide. Okay, really quickly, um, Empire State Development, these are the non-for-profit capital grants. These go through the CFA. It's up to 100,000, um, the 50% match is required. You use the CFA, it's the same deadlines of July 31. There are other, in Empire State Development ones that are accepted on a rolling basis, they're more money and all of that. These are specifically for nonprofits. Next, please. Um, these are their, you know, the priorities, it's business investment, economic growth, strategic focus, and those are the, the areas. Next. Um, so yeah, the key to these is they're not your typical co capital project grant. It is the state making an investment in your organization. And they're investing in your project too as a way to um, foster organizational growth that will better conserve the community and the state. So the focus will focus on two things. How do you fill the priorities and what to what degree? So you have to be very specific on the data. You know, your demographic consists of X number of children. Why have inadequate childcare? The project um, will you know, create X number of new childcare spots in the area um, and all of that. So really it's it's hard numbers. You need to kind of bolster this. The second part of this application is your organizational capacity. If you're able to take it on and sustain it. So they're gonna be looking at your financial statements, asking about organizational history, um, existing services, staff, leadership, all of that. Um, and again, lots of data and information out there, local census report, the Office of Children and Family Services, if you're doing a child care project, has a lot of information and all of that. And I'll wrap up really quickly with the last, next slide, is the NISCA, New York State Council on the Arts, their capital project grants. These are not part of the CFA, they used to be. They now have their own application portal. They're released in September. They're due in January. They're for construction, equipment, and hybrid construction projects. Um, 
new construction, renovation, expansions, all about um, arts organizations. They, if you're doing an equipment, it must be permanent, basically bolted to the building. A portable sound system or lighting system is not eligible. Next slide. We have two tracks for organizations with operating under 2 million. There are set grants at 10, 25, and 50,000, and it has to be that amount. You can't deviate from that, but there's no match requirement, which is wonderful. The next one, next slide, please, is bigger. These are you know, much larger grants, 50 to 2 million. They fund 50%, and this does require a match, but all organizations can apply. You're not limited by your operational budget. And it should be noted that these are not or economic development grants. They are arts focused. So you're going to have to look at how your project advances the arts within the state. Again, go back to the governor because she's got ours pluribus unum, which is her new sort of arts creative placemaking program. Fit that in. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's about that. And I don't want to say too much more because the guidelines have not been released. And if they change it, I could be completely wrong. And that's it. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much, Susan. That was ama an amazing amount of information. We could have you back for two hours. Um, Brianna, since we're gonna be sending these out, maybe you can uh, stop your screen share. We have exactly seven minutes, although I'm able to stay a little longer. I'm not sure if our presenters can stay a couple extra minutes. So if we do have some, I'm, I'm sure we have questions. Okay, sure. does anyone have a question? <laughs> I want to keep talking here there. That was so great. Like, I love Susan, how you brought in from, you know, looking at the big picture and so many different impacts. That was really amazing how you did that as grant writers. I think we all want to be able to do that for every single grant. Um, Just if you have a question, remember to unmute yourself and raise your hand. Okay. Natalie. <laughs> yes, Natalie, go ahead. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. This is really, really informative. Um, so I'm with the Mount Kisco Interfaith Food Pantry, and I'm I'm really familiar with the NISCA applications. I used to work in more in the arts sphere, but I'm, you know, looking through the examples that you presented, it's not immediately clear to me um, whether uh, these sorts of opportunities would be relevant for um, human services organizations or like the work that the pantry is doing. And I'm wondering if anyone here has experience with um, applying through uh, this portal and having success with any of the funding programs that would align with something like um, like uh, 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 organ um, organizations that are working in food insecurity. Or like other direct services, so. Yeah. Steve, you want to take it or you want me to take it? I mean, the, the, Go ahead. the response, it's, it's absolutely. Um, my background is in arts, obviously, so that's where I'm going to go. Um, so yeah, but you really need the, the CFA resource book is out and that will outline all of the opportunities that are available, you know, Empire State Development, um, De um Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, I'm not sure if, um, child and family services has a grant in this cycle. Um, so yeah, so really look at that and you will see the variety. Um, and then also go down to the very end because grants like the Empire State Development, um, the nonprofit grant is down there. So there's other sort of grants that are from other agencies, but are CFA only as opposed to rolling. Um, Can I ask you a quick question? Um, <laughs> Natalie, what do you have any capital needs at your at your uh, facility? Any equipment or needs to for building something that will help make your facility better? Not immediately, but we have our eye to it, which is sort of why I'm thinking about these sorts of opportunities for the organization. So right now we're operating out of a church and we're sort of at capacity. So looking forward, our right. board is looking for new space and, and building at that space in various ways. Well, the nonprofit the capital fund is really a godsend. It's relatively new. They did it for the first time last year. Um, it, it's not going to support a major build, but it can certainly support, you know, renovations and improvements to your, uh, you know, your headquarters or your facility. Uh, and it's a, it's a generous program at a hundred thousand dollars maximum, but you, you would need a project cost of 200,000 or more to meet the match, but um, 
we had we had many of our nonprofit clients apply last year, uh, and it, it, because that kind of money was always hard to get for them, and uh, so I think it's a very popular program. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you both. Anybody else? I have a question. I'm sorry, I can't find the hand raise feature. Um, I am interested in looking at the not-for-profit uh, capital grants that you were just speaking about. Um, so I, I think I understand, right, that the 50% match means that the highest maximum grant you can receive would be the 100000 and then you Correct. would also need to contribute 100000 for a project at least. of 200 or more. Yeah. Okay. And then I yep. also saw that there was something about 10% equity that would need to be contributed. I was reading some materials earlier, and I was just hoping someone could explain what that means. That That, that is a, an Empire State Development uh, guideline for um, capital projects that are usually done by private entities. Um I, I didn't think that the 10% equity requirement was... was was in there because you know you're a nonprofit and you you don't have ten percent sitting around doing nothing. You know it's I think it's more that that guideline is more for private development and 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 things like that. Yeah, if if you sorry, go ahead, Alyssa. No, I yeah, I was just watching a webinar I found earlier this morning about that, and I was confused by that. So I just was hoping to figure out what that. The thing is, there's different sub programs of VSD. So there's the main grant program, and then there's Market New York. There's the, uh, I think NISCA coordinates with ESD also. Not on anymore. The Not program. anymore. No. Not anymore. Okay. No. So, but yeah, it's important to look at the guidelines within the sub grant program. Yeah. And then another suggestion, too, is, is if you go, I think it's on the resources page you can actually look at all the application questions and see what it, that you can download them in a Word document, which makes life easier, but you can also see what all the questions are and what is required. Um, and yep. sometimes, and yeah, because the ESD nonprofit, because I've done both, it, it's slightly different than the regular ESD for the, yep. you know, the up to 600 grants. So yeah, there are a lot of things that they've taken out that because it's a nonprofit. Right. Great. Anybody Thank else? you. Yes, I have a question in the chat, actually a couple questions. So one's a clarification, really. So Steve, you had mentioned in the beginning that um, submitting separate applications for different projects, do you recommend submitting applications for different funding as well, different funders? So uh, I'm sorry, want... I'm getting some garbling. Um, no, it's more, it's more, even though you can access several different funding programs through one CFA application, as soon as you um, program that into the application by, you know, at the beginning of the application, you're given the choices of programs you want to apply to in, in the, in the, in the beginning of it, and then it populates you know, if you select several different uh, programs, it'll populate all of their peculiar questions, their, their unique questions. And the problem becomes trying to sort out what you're saying to each each separate agency that you're applying to through one application, then it becomes kind of muddled. So sometimes we're saying, you know, you may be better served by doing an ESD application for your project and then doing a separate NYSERDA application if you're going to go for, say, the um, the um, Carbon Neutral Economic Development Program or whatever it is, so that the two don't compete with each other in the same application. Okay, excellent. And then if you had different okay. projects, you would do that again for your next project and exactly. apply individually. Okay, yep. great. I yep. love that. Excellent. And then um, the Right Nature Center had a second question regarding the reimbursement. Is that just at the end when you've totally completed or can you be in, reimbursed throughout the um, contract? Good question. Now that that is kind of a negotiated element. 
when when you are awarded a grant, particularly from ESD, it goes to the contractual post award. It goes to a contractual phase called the incentive agreement, and that incentive agreement is worked out between the awardee and the the, the funder and the recipient. Um, you can request what I call cash flow adv advances on your project when you meet certain hurdles. Um, like, let's say you're 50% done with your project, you could demonstrate that expense through vouchers and other proof and then get, you know, maybe half of the award uh, to, to help uh, with cash flow. But you do have to, you have to ask for it. They normally will say, you know, you got to finish the thing and get a CEO before you're going to get your money. And do we know if they're using the SFS this year for the invoicing and the reimbursement or no one's sure? I'm about sorry? That. Are we using um, SFS, the new state system for the reimbursement or? Oh, I don't done know. Separately. Yeah. I, I, haven't I seen think that that's yet. done separately okay. through ESD. They, you know, they, they put you own. actually in touch with a, with an accountant, an ESD accountant, who is Great. the recipient of your vouchers and and, and all that. Mm -hmm. I know that it is 103. So those of you who have to leave us, thank you so much for joining. But I don't want to stop the questions because we have this <laughs> these great sources of information here. So <laughs> does anyone have any other questions? Please feel free to... Uh, oh, Gary, my buddy Gary, Gary? go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Gary. Hi there. Thank Hi. you very much, Steve and Susan. Um, Susan, that was a fabulously concise uh, summary of your approach to the CFA, particularly regarding the Southside Sportsman's Club. I have to ask, are you an angler? No. <laughs> I, I, I am. No. Oh, I okay. am. And I, <laughs> and I went with yeah. Trout Unlimited. I went with Trout Unlimited to that facility and it was wonderful. It really was prior to COVID. It was a, it's a beautiful yeah, place. It's, uh, Steve can thank Susan. <laughs> thank you, Susan. It is, it is one of the finest trout fishing sites in the country, if not the world. Yeah. And yeah, and, and my running joke was, is I know more about infectious pancreatic necrosis virus than I will ever need to know. <laughs> I posted that on Facebook and everyone thought I was sick. So, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, it, my question is, uh, so I, at Vassar, one of the struggles I, I often have is the actual and perceived wealth of my organization mm -hmm. if Vassar could actually pay for everything it wanted or needed I wouldn't have a job and I wonder if with this the the CFA the applications that go through there and especially the capital ones do you have any right. suggestions for navigating that on that sort of implied issue, is it can, a matter of, of just cleaving to your case and tying your local need into the state need? Should it be taken head on? Anything along those lines, I'd appreciate. It, I'll take a crack at that first, Susan, if, if you don't mind. It, it, is, uh, it is peculiar that the CFA uh, ESD grant program asks you, um, you know, why you need this money and what you would do if you didn't get it. And so hey, Alder, there's yeah. a bit of a, there's a bit of a tap dance that we do, you know, essentially saying we, we don't say that if you don't give us this money, this, uh, this part won't happen. We say something along the lines of we'll work really, really hard to make this happen, but it'll slow everything down. And if you, the state, want to invest in something that you say you care a lot about, then you'll you'll grant us some funding. The other part of it is the you know the rich person part. I work for you know clients who are billionaires um, that are doing projects throughout the Hudson Valley and and in Western New York, and they often say, you know, why would they give me money for my resort project? And I say because the company isn't rich. 
the company that you've created isn't rich. The company you've created it is, you know, is a vessel. It's done nothing. So to demonstrate that the person behind that company has some means is good, but that the company stands or falls based upon its own financial merits. So a lot of probably what Vassar has to offer is that, you know, Yes, we have a good endowment, but it, it is there for different purposes. And this project is going to serve a need, what whether it's to I don't know what it is, but it it's it's to help students, it's to help advance education, it's to help, you know, yeah. science. I you know, you you have to you have to not be self conscious about the ask. Mm. I think the other thing, too, is going back to the poverty level. You're in Poughkeepsie. And I would assume that Vassar, to some degree, helps the economy. You know, you're, you're creating jobs for people of Poughkeepsie and all of that. So I right. think, you know, that you can bring that into it, that it's not only, you know, look at your student population and who fits into that but also look at how, again, going back to that local need, how your presence is bolstering the local community. And I mean, when I worked with NYU, we got hit with this too, but it really was like looking at the demographics of your students and being able to say like, yeah, I mean, I worked, I worked at the art conservation program. You couldn't get more white, more wealthy than that, but it was, you know, the, you know, yes, but these are where these kids are coming from. And they, this is the poverty in those areas. And they're coming to us. And yes, we're spending our resources to give them the financial they, they need to come here to get an education. Right. But that degree, we need, we need the extra help to do this capital project. And how, look, how many more, again, go back to that data, how many more can we serve if we have this new building or extend, extended building, whatever. Excellent, thank you. Tight lines, Steve. Tight lines. <laughs> I'll see you out there. Thank you, guys. Um, Steve, I know you said something like, optional is not optional. So that's always good to know. Guys, don't <laughs> believe it. If it says optional, they want those answers. Is there anything like that that you can think of, not to put you on the spot, or if you think of it, maybe email me and I'll send it out to this group. But you know, things sure like will. that are very important. You know, if it says optional, someone thinks, well, you know, I don't have anything developed for that answer. or I'm not going to add, you know, always answer it, right? Always always, always answer something. the question. <laughs> yes. That's right. Absolutely. All right. Uh -huh. and Susan, any other? Oh, Deborah. Deborah, Deborah has a question. So I have this question I've been wanting to ask both of you, which I think Steve knows a little bit, which is about, about that I wanted to ask you this. Um, if you knew then what you <laughs> know now what do you have to tell us all about the cfa oh that's easy that's a good one it's that's a good, good one, one but Susan. It's easy. what's that be prepared to read a lot of really really boring reports um yeah. yeah, I I spend the most of the month of the month of June doing the research for these grants before I even start writing. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're reading, you know, the South Shore Estuary Management Comp Comprehensive Plan, it's a real doozer. Um, yeah, so just be prepared to slog through those. Um, but it's necessary because there could be that little gem in there that can turn you your application around and suddenly you're getting a huge amount of funding. So very yeah. true, very true. On my side, it was um how incredibly simple uh certain grant programs that that provide millions of dollars can be. The applications themselves for for Empire State Development, there's no opportunity for uploading plans. There's no opportunity for uploading photographs. I mean, in the parks application, they want a site plan. They want to see a lot of things. Empire State Development is incredibly simple, I think, because it's a reimbursement grant, and you basically have to build what you said you were going to build in order to get the money. But 
all that grant is won or lost on project description, statement of need, um, you know, job creation, economic impact. And so that really is where you've got to, you've got to write very, and, and because of character count restrictions, you've got to write very concisely and um, insightfully about, you know, the kinds of things they want to see in order to award you the funds. Uh, you can't make stuff up, but you've got to make it sing, if you know what I mean. So be exactly. simple, and straightforward, and unique, apparently. <laughs> Very good. And back <laughs> it up. Pretty much. And Pretty back much. it up, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Who else has a pressing question since we're we're stealing these guys a couple more minutes? Anyone else? That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Well, I don't see any hands, and I don't want to keep us here if um, if we don't have questions. I'm sure we'll all think of something immediately after and say, oh, I should have asked them that. Um, but thank you both so much. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Steve, Susan, and Brianna so much. Um, I've been, I've learned so much and just been thrilled to have you. Um, well, thank you for having us. It, it's been great. And, uh, you know, shoot me an email if you have any more questions. Happy to yeah, help. Yeah, same here. Same here. Right. So, yeah. Thank you so, so much.